Picture this. It's early 1938, and a young man with thick glasses and nervous energy walks through the heavy iron gates of Rolls-Royce in Derby, England, clutching his leather briefcase a little too tightly. His name is Stanley Hooker. He's got a shiny new doctorate in fluid dynamics from Oxford, and he's about to start his first real job. But here's the thing that makes this story so incredible. Stanley Hooker knows almost nothing about engineering. He's a mathematician, a theorist, someone who lives in the world of equations and calculations rather than grease and metal. When Ernest Hives, the tough, no-nonsense works manager at Rolls-Royce, sits across from him in that first interview, he looks at Hooker's academic credentials with barely concealed disappointment and says something that would haunt Hooker for years. Not much of an engineer, are you? It's dismissive, it's cutting, and honestly, it's probably fair. But what Ernest Hives doesn't know, what nobody in that factory could possibly imagine, is that this awkward mathematician is about to become one of the most important engineers in aviation history. Stanley Hooker would spend the rest of his life proving that first impression spectacularly, undeniably wrong. Within just a few weeks of starting at Rolls-Royce, something happens that changes everything. Hooker is wandering around the factory, still trying to figure out where everything is, still feeling like an outsider in this world of experienced engineers and skilled craftsmen when he stumbles into the supercharger test section. Now, if you don't know what a supercharger is, let me explain it simply. Imagine your car engine trying to breathe at the top of Mount Everest. The air is so thin that it can barely suck in enough oxygen to burn fuel properly. A supercharger solves this problem by forcing more air into the engine, like giving it an oxygen mask. For aircraft engines, especially fighter planes that need to dogfight at 20 or 30,000 feet, where the air is impossibly thin, the supercharger isn't just important, it's absolutely critical. It's the difference between having power to climb and turn or becoming a sitting duck for enemy fighters. And that's why there are engineers gathered around tables covered in experimental plots and test curves, trying to squeeze every last bit of performance out of the Merlin engine supercharger. Hooker stands there watching them, curious about these strange graphs covered in data points and performance curves, and he asks if he can borrow the test results. The engineers probably think it's cute, this young mathematician wanting to play with their real-world data, so they let him take copies home. That night, and for several nights after, Hooker sits at his small desk with a pot of tea growing cold beside him, working through the aerodynamic calculations with his mathematician's eye, seeing patterns and relationships that the experienced engineers have somehow missed. His conclusion, when he finally reaches it, is startling. The rotor and diffuser of the Merlin supercharger the heart of Britain's best fighter engine, are fundamentally mismatched. They don't work together properly. The efficiency is hovering around 65% when his calculations show it could theoretically reach 75% or even higher. The losses are enormous, like trying to force water through a kinked hose, like running a race with your shoelaces tied together. It's not that the engineers who designed it were incompetent. It's that they didn't have the mathematical tools to see what Hooker could see. Nervously, because he's still the new guy who isn't much of an engineer, Hooker writes up his findings in a careful, detailed report. When he gives it to the chief designer, his hands are probably shaking a little. He's about to tell some of Britain's most experienced aircraft engineers that they've been doing something wrong for years. The response comes faster than he expects. Within just a few days, a man named Elor, the head of supercharger development, bursts into Hooker's tiny office, waving the report and demanding, Did you write this? Hooker admits that yes, he did, and he's probably expecting criticism, maybe even mockery. Instead, Elor looks at him with something like amazement and says, Well done, jolly good stuff. From now on, you're in charge of supercharger development. Just like that, with no ceremony and no warning, the mathematician with no engineering credentials is suddenly responsible for one of the most critical components of Britain's fighter engines. The Merlin supercharger hasn't been substantially changed since its original design back in 1934, and now it's in the hands of someone who's barely been at the company for a month. Hooker doesn't waste time. He immediately goes to work redesigning the intake duct, the impeller, and the diffuser, 
using his mathematical understanding of fluid dynamics to create shapes and curves that work together instead of fighting each other. The improvements are incorporated into the Merlin 20 and then the Merlin 45, and when they test it, the results are almost unbelievable. Power output increases by 30%. 30%! That's not a minor improvement. That's not tweaking around the edges. That's a transformation. The Merlin 45 enters service in the Spitfire Mark V in October 1940, and it gets produced in greater numbers than any other Spitfire variant. Think about the timing here. Britain is fighting for its survival in the desperate air battles of 1940 and 1941, and Hooker's redesigned supercharger is giving British pilots the power they need to survive, to fight, to win. But here's the thing about brilliant engineers. They're never satisfied. Even as his supercharger is helping Britain survive, Hooker already knows they've reached a ceiling. By 1940, he's calculated that refining the existing single-stage supercharger will only give marginal improvements. The physics won't allow anything more. The maximum efficient compression ratio you can get from a single impeller is about 4 to 1, and that's not enough. To fight at 30,000 feet and above, where the new German fighters are operating, where the air is so thin you can barely breathe, they need something radically different. That's when the Air Ministry comes to Rolls-Royce with a request. They want a turbocharged Merlin for the high-altitude Wellington Mark VI bomber. Now turbocharging is the American solution to the altitude problem. Instead of using engine power to drive the compressor, you use the exhaust gases to spin a turbine that drives the compressor. It's elegant in theory, and the American Army Air Forces absolutely love turbochargers. They work beautifully on big bombers like the B-17 because there's room for all the heavy ducting, all the intercoolers, all the control systems. But Hooker looks at the Air Ministry's turbocharger request, does the mathematics, and says something that takes real courage. No, it's not arrogance, it's not stubbornness, it's mathematics. Turbochargers require massive amounts of expensive stainless steel ducting, to handle exhaust gases that reach 600 degrees. In a bomber, where you have space and weight to spare, that's manageable. In a fighter, where every single pound matters and space is at an absolute premium, it's a nightmare. The Germans had tried turbocharged fighters and failed spectacularly. The Focke-Wulf 190C Kangaroo prototype was rejected due to reliability problems with the high-temperature alloys. The Russians tried turbocharging everything and created a long list of explosions, fires, and mechanical failures. Hooker has studied all of this, and he knows there's a better way. His idea is beautiful in its simplicity. Put two supercharger stages in series on a single shaft, driven by a two-speed gearbox. The first stage compresses the incoming air. Then that compressed air passes through an intercooler essentially a radiator that cools it down and makes it denser, and then the second stage compresses it again. Two stages of compression with cooling in between. It's simple in concept but revolutionary in execution. By placing two superchargers in series, Hooker calculates the Merlin could develop 1,000 horsepower at 30,000 feet, literally double what the single-stage version produces. The compression ratio jumps from about 4 to 1 to over six and a half to one. But here's the truly elegant part that shows Hooker's genius. Because both impellers sit on the same shaft, there's no turbocharger lag, no temperamental exhaust-driven turbines, no miles of red-hot ducting, just clean, mechanical, reliable supercharging. The Air Ministry had requested one solution, but Hooker rejected it and gave them something better. By late 1941, Hooker's two-stage supercharger is qualified in the Merlin 61, and the results are extraordinary. The new engine gets fitted to the Spitfire Mark 9, and suddenly the Royal Air Force has an answer to the Focke Wolf 190, a German fighter that's been dominating the skies since early 1941, making British pilots feel outmatched and vulnerable. At 30,000 feet, the Spitfire Mark 9 is 70 miles per hour faster than the Mark 5. The rate of climb nearly doubles. The service ceiling reaches 47,000 feet, so high that pilots need pressure suits. Hermann Göring's pilots, who had enjoyed six months of superiority, who had been shooting down Spitfires almost at will, 
suddenly find themselves outclassed again. The Merlin 61 becomes the second most produced Spitfire engine variant, and Hooker continues refining his design throughout the war, eventually pushing the Merlin from its original 8080 horsepower in 1933 to over 2,500 horsepower by war's end, with test demonstrations reaching an incredible 2,180 horsepower. That's the power of understanding fluid dynamics, of trusting mathematics, and of refusing to accept that good enough is actually good enough. Now here's where the story takes an unexpected turn and becomes even more important. In April 1942, a Rolls-Royce test pilot named Ronald Harker flies a North American P-51 Mustang at an airfield called Duxford. The aircraft is fast and beautiful at low altitude, slicing through the air with an elegant efficiency that makes experienced pilots smile. But above 15,000 feet, its American Allison engine can't maintain power. The Allison has a single-stage supercharger, which is perfectly adequate at medium altitude, but hopeless in the thin air where bomber escorts have to fight. Harker lands, and instead of just filing a routine report, he writes a memo that literally changes history. He says, with the clarity of someone who really understands what he's just experienced, that with a powerful and good engine like the Merlin 61, the Mustang's performance could be outstanding. The Merlin 61, Stanley Hooker's two-stage supercharged masterpiece, the engine the Air Ministry didn't ask for. Rolls-Royce immediately requests five Mustang airframes for conversion, and the engineering challenge is substantial. The Merlin is 355 pounds heavier than the Allison, which means the entire aircraft balance has to be recalculated. Hooker's two-stage supercharger with its intercooler makes the engine five inches taller, so the cowling has to be redesigned. The intercooler radiator has to be integrated into the airframe without destroying the Mustang's beautiful aerodynamics. Coolant lines have to be completely redesigned. The carburetor is different. Updraft instead of downdraft, which moves the air intake from above the propeller to below it changing the entire nose profile. On October 13, 1942, the first Merlin-powered Mustang flies, and the transformation is complete and total. Maximum speed, 413 miles per hour at 22,000 feet and 433 miles per hour at higher altitude. Absolute ceiling, 40,600 feet. The Mustang has gone from being a good low-altitude fighter to being potentially the best fighter in the world. North American Aviation, watching from across the Atlantic, immediately begins their own conversion program. They receive authorization for the XP-51B in July 1942 and fly it on November 30th, just weeks after the British prototype. The Americans, with their talent for practical engineering, go even further than the British conversion. They completely redesign the cooling system to be more efficient. They strengthen the airframe to handle the extra power and weight and most importantly, they add an 85-gallon fuselage tank that gives the Mustang unprecedented range. By June 1943, P-51Bs are rolling off assembly lines in California and Texas, powered by Packard-built Merlin engines designated v 165 d which are essentially American-manufactured versions of Hooker's design. With two drop tanks, the combat radius exceeds 750 miles, that number might not sound impressive until you realize what it means. Berlin and back. The bomber crews, who had been dying in their hundreds over Germany without fighter escort, who had to watch their friends' aircraft explode or spiral down in flames while they flew on helplessly, finally have protection all the way to the target and home again. Brigadier General Tommy Hayes, who flew combat missions in Mustangs and knew what he was talking about, said it perfectly and plainly. The airplane had the three qualities you need most if you're going to escort bombers to Berlin. Range, range, and range. But here's the crucial point that people often miss. None of that range mattered without altitude performance. You could have all the fuel in the world. But if you couldn't fight effectively at 25,000 or 30,000 feet where the bombers operated and where the German fighters attacked, you were useless. And the altitude performance the ability to dogfight in thin air, to climb and turn and chase, came from one source. Stanley Hooker's two-stage supercharger, the design the Air Ministry hadn't asked for. 
The solution Hooker created when he rejected their turbocharger request and insisted there was a better way. Hermann Göring, testifying at Nuremberg after the war, said something that reveals just how much impact Hooker's work had. He said that when he saw American fighters escorting bombers over Berlin, deep in the heart of Germany where no fighter should have the range to reach, he knew Germany had lost. Those fighters were P-51 Mustangs, and their engines, whether built by Rolls-Royce in Derby, England, or by Packard in Detroit, Michigan, all used Stanley Hooker's two-stage supercharger design. The mathematician, who wasn't much of an engineer, had created the power plant that helped win the air war over Europe. He did it by trusting his calculations over conventional wisdom. By rejecting the solution the air ministry wanted and giving them the solution they actually needed. And by understanding that elegant engineering beats brute force every single time. But Stanley Hooker's story doesn't end with the war. In 1971, when Rolls-Royce was facing bankruptcy due to cost overruns on the RB211 jet engine program, Hooker came out of retirement to save the company. He rescued the RB211 program through brilliant technical leadership and hard-nosed management. He designed the Pegasus engine that powered the Harrier jump jet, one of the most innovative aircraft designs ever created. He was knighted in 1974 for his contributions to British engineering and aviation. And when he published his autobiography in 1984, just before his death, he gave it a title that must have brought a bittersweet smile to anyone who knew his story. He called it, not much of an engineer, taking Ernest Hives's dismissive comment from that first interview back in 1938 and turning it into something both ironic and profound. History proved otherwise. Stanley Hooker was exactly the kind of engineer the world needed, especially in its darkest hour. He was someone who could look at the impossible, do the mathematics, reject the obvious solution, and create something better. The P-51 Mustang became a legend, one of the most famous and beloved aircraft ever built. But it took a mathematician's refusal to follow orders, his insistence on finding a better way to give it the engine that made that legend possible.